Carter Report presents worship from the Community Adventist Fellowship in Glendale, California. A special welcome to all of our viewers in North America and our new friends and churches in Russia. Today, you'll enjoy outstanding music and the preaching of the everlasting gospel by pastor, teacher, and evangelist John Carter. Please get your Bible and study the Word of God with us today. Thank you for joining us for Worship and Praise. I wish to give at this time a very special welcome to our viewers on 3ABN and our other television stations and a very special welcome to the congregation today. Today we're going to talk about the greatest crisis that is facing the United States and not only a great crisis that is facing the United States but a crisis that is facing the whole wide world. There is without any question the greatest earthquake coming to America. I'm not referring to an earthquake that's going to shake Los Angeles, 
but I'm referring to the great financial earthquake. I believe that this nation and, in, and this world is standing right on the very edge of the greatest and the most amazing event. And before I talk today about the coming earthquake that's going to shake the whole world and shake this nation very soon, I believe, I would like you please to take your Bible and come with me to the words of Jesus where Jesus talks about worry. Matthew chapter 6, and I'd like you to start, if you don't mind, at verse 24. And I do want you, please, dear friend, to notice these words. Because as I talk today about the financial crisis, and I've already given a, a presentation in this church on this subject, I know that some of you are going to become a little afraid. My message for you today is this, we need not worry because God will take care of us. I want you to know that for a start. God has promised, I will take care of you. So I want to start my message today with a reaffirmation of the great truth that God has promised to look after his people. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 and onwards, the Bible says, Jesus says, but no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The Bible says a person who loves money more than he loves God will never be saved in the kingdom. The Bible says you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you will serve. So you can't be saved if you're a lover of money. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will uh, about your body uh, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So the Bible says, if God takes care of the birds and if God takes care of, of the flowers, won't he take care of us? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his statue? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither uh, toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Now listen to these words, precious friend. Jesus says, therefore, say it with me. Therefore, do not worry. There it is. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all of these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. God says, do not worry, but trust me and realize this, that I care for you more than you care for your children. So before we think of the bad news today, I want you to know the good news that we have a Father in heaven who has told us, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> have you heard uh, the story of, of the man who had a great business and he had great problems with his business? And uh, he was often worried. Uh, but then he came to work one day or went out to lunch and, uh, and he was talking to some friends and he seemed to be so light-hearted and so glad and so full of joy. And uh, one of his business acquaintances said to him, oh, why aren't you worrying? Well, he said, uh, I've just got on to a great idea. He said, I've just decided to employ a man to worry for me. And he said, uh, well, he said, but business is pretty bad here in Los Angeles. Uh, how much are you going to pay him? He said, I'm going to pay him $150,000 a year so I don't have to worry. 
his business friend said, where on earth are you going to get that sort of money? He said, that's his first worry. <laughs> now, I want to tell you today, God has told me I don't need to worry because he's going to take care of it. But if I wasn't a believer today in God, I would be very worried because the United States of America is in debt not for four billion, but right at this moment, this great land, the greatest nation on the face of the earth, the most powerful nation and the wealthiest nation is in debt to the sum of four trillion dollars. Now, to give you, to give you some idea of what a trillion dollars is, let me give you this illustration. Uh, if today I had a million dollars in one thousand dollar bills, I've never even seen a thousand dollar bill. I understand you can get them. We don't get a lot in the congregational plate, but <laughs> maybe there just aren't any thousand dollar bills. I've never seen one. But if you were to take a stack of thousand dollar bills and four inch high and tightly compress them, that would be a million dollars. Now to get a billion dollars, my friend, you would need a stack of thousand dollar bills. This is a billion dollars, 300 feet high. But a trillion dollars would need a stack of one thousand dollar bills stacked so close together so there was no movement, and that stack would be 63 miles high. That's a trillion dollars. And right now this great land, which has prided itself on its rugged independence, is in debt for at least four thousand billion dollars. The debt alone every year is consuming the American taxpayer and these figures are conservative because they're changing all the time and they're, they're going up all the time. But right now we are paying around three thousand million or three hundred billion dollars. Let me say it again because I think I confused the figures. The the interest that we are paying today right now on the debt is three hundred billion dollars or three hundred thousand million dollars and that right at this moment is consuming around fifty percent of every dollar that you pay in personal income taxes. And so as you pay Uncle Sam a thousand dollars five hundred dollars of that is not going to make this a better nation that is going simply to service the interest on the debt which now stands at four hundred trillion dollars which would mean a stack of one thousand dollar bills two hundred and fifty miles high now people say is it as serious as you're trying to make out. Uh, let, me tell you, let me tell you, my beloved friends, uh, some books that I think you ought to read. You ought to get this book by Larry Burkett, uh, who is uh, an outstanding writer. The book is called The Coming Economic Earthquake. And I would also recommend this book that I have spoken to you about before, Bankruptcy 1995, The Coming Collapse of America and how to stop it. And I notice in the most recent copy of Time magazine, there is an article for the book 1995, and, the, and they're saying here, unless something tremendous happens today in the White House, and in Congress, and in the Senate, and in the homes of the American people, we are facing a disaster without parallel in the history, not of America, but the history of the world. Now the figures I'm going to give you now are pretty solid and they're pretty sound. But nobody can really tell you, tie it down, because nobody really knows how bad it is. You see, if there's ever a person who's standing in the need of prayer today, it is the President of the United States of America, Bill Clinton. 
Because as the uh, Wall Street Journal has said, uh, President Clinton has discovered that when he was going to try to halve the deficit, he found that this was impossible because the deficit was double what he thought it was going to be. And if, now please listen to this. If present trends continue, even with this new budget, listen to me because uh, you, you need to think this through. If present trends continue, even with the new budget that is being passed today, by the year 2000, the deficit may have reached the astronomical figure. Right now it's four trillion, but it is quite likely that by the year 2000, on uh, present day calculations, it could reach 20 trillion dollars. By the year 2000, for every dollar that you pay in tax, they'll, the government will need to find two dollars to pay the interest on the debt. And, by the, and, and even if it doesn't get to 20 trillion, some say it'll only get to 10 trillion. If it only gets to 10 trillion, then every dollar that is paid in personal income taxes in the land of America, every dollar is going to pay not for the deficit, but for the interest on the deficit. No nation in the history of the world has been able to survive a, a similar set of circumstances. And this is relatively new. Because 20 years ago, even though there was a deficit that was growing, it was nothing, nothing like it is today. And the last 10 years have seen the deficit go right up. Now, for the last 100 years, the deficit moved like this. Moved like this. But now, Every graph, every graph that is put out by the government, every graph that is put out by any responsible group of uh, economists show the deficit not going like this, but the deficit going straight up. And there doesn't seem to be any way to pull it back. And some economists say that the present budget that is being voted uh, by the Senate and by, uh, by the House and uh, by our president, this, this budget that has been put together is not going to actually reduce the deficit, it is going to increase the deficit. Now, I'm not an economist, but I'm telling you the views of people who are tremendously concerned today. If what I'm telling you is true, if these men are right, if this is true, then society, as you and I understand it, is going to be drastically changed in a very short time, and our lifestyle is going to be changed tremendously. Just for your interest's sake, and just for a little bit of humor, because Beverly said to me, give him a little bit of humor today, when I told her this stuff. She said, just try to find something that is a little bit light. Let me tell you, how our government spends our taxes, at least some of our taxes. $49 million for a rock and roll museum. $15 million to Dartmouth College as part of a jobs creation program. A total of 39 jobs were created at a cost of $324,685 each. $1.36 million for preliminary work on an $18.6 million uh, project to turn Miami Boulevard into an exotic garden for the people. $566 million, rising to $900 million later in 1991, to send American cows to Europe to participate in an export enhancement program. $500,000 to study the effects of cigarette smoking on dogs. $107,000 to study the mating habits of Japanese quail. $19 million to study whether belching by cows and other livestock harms the ozone. $84,000 to study why people fall in love. They could have asked me, wouldn't have cost them anything. $50,000 to prove that sheepdogs do, in fact, protect sheep. $46,000 to determine how long it takes to cook 
breakfast eggs. $90,000 to study the social and behavioral aspects of vegetarians. You could have asked me that also, because I'm a vegetarian. $219,592 to teach college students how to watch television. $2,500 to investigate the causes of rudeness, lying, and cheating on tennis courts. $25,000 to find the best location for a new gym for the House of Representatives. $2 million to renovate one of the House's restaurants. $350,000 to renovate the House beauty parlor and six million dollars to upgrade the Senate subway system. Now, it's not all like that, folks, but a lot of it is. And so, we have today a situation that many economists will tell us is pretty much out of control. Let me tell you how much the government, the U.S. government, takes in every year. The U.S. government takes in, through our taxes and other means of income, 1.4 trillion dollars, which is a lot of money. But the government doesn't spend $1.4 trillion. The government right now is spending $1.8 trillion. And so how can you spend what you don't have? How do you do this? How do you spend what you don't have? Well, the American government, like most of us, knows how to do it. You go and you get a loan. And this is going to lead many economists believe to what is called the phenomenon that is called hyperinflation. Now, let me tell you about hyperinflation because none of us in this country have ever seen hyperinflation. We have seen inflation rates at 12 and 13 percent, but we've never seen inflation rates at 5,000 percent as they saw recently in Brazil and as they saw in Germany after the First World War. Now, let me tell you what the government most likely will be forced to do. And this is scary when you discover what they'll be forced to do. When the day comes, and this could happen in two years, in five years, or in ten years. When the time comes, when there is not enough money to service the debt, the creditors are going to say, we want our money. And the American government will have these options. Number one, to say, we are bankrupt and we've got to close down. No government in the history of the world has ever uh, said that officially. But the American government would have to say, we are bankrupt, bankrupt to the people, and bankrupt particularly to the Japanese. But there's another alternative. And the government could say this, we will raise taxes. Instead of you paying 30 uh, cents in the dollar, you'll have to pay 75, 80 cents in the dollar on your taxes. Most people are not going to accept that very gladly. But there is a third alternative, and that has been done by other nations in the history of the world in this century, and that is to print money. And when the government says, how are we going to service the debt? How are we going to pay all the entitlements? How are we going to pay the welfare of all of the people? How are we going to pay for this person and that person and that organization? How are we going to supply the money? They'll say, well, that's relatively easy. We will start to print more money. And when the government starts to print money, to service the debt, there is only one end in view. And this is, this is absolutely certain. There's no doubt about this. When the United States government, and they're going to do it, when they start to print money to service the debt, then we're going to have the phenomenon that is called hyperinflation. Let me tell you about it. In Germany, and some of my German brothers and sisters who attend to this church, come to this church, attend this church, uh, may even remember some of these things. After the First World War, because of the way Germany was dealt with by Britain and France, the Allies, who were victorious, Germany was reduced to the state of being a pauper. And Germany had no resources left. And most, many of the people were out of work. And so the German government said, there's only one thing we can do. 
we will service the debt by printing money. The German mark, before they started to print more money, traded at four marks to the dollar. And as soon as they started to print money, within a few hours, the mark was trading at eight to the dollar, and then 20 to the dollar, and then 700 to the dollar, and then a million to the dollar, and finally four trillion marks to the dollar. In the end, the inflation became so great that people waiting in line to buy food would see prices double and triple and quarple while they waited for five minutes to buy food. What happened in Brazil at the end of the 80s? They did exactly the same thing. Brazil was in debt to the tune of $40 billion. I wish America was in debt to the tune of $40 billion. They were in debt to the tune of $40 billion. And so they started to print money to service the debt. And within a few weeks in Brazil, the inflation rate was running at five, wait, wait for it, at 5,000%. 5,000%. As people slept in their beds in Brazil, they'd go to bed and something say this book was worth a million. Whatever. It was worth a million. When they'd wake up the next morning, it was worth three million. As they slept. Now listen to what I'm going to try to tell you. If this is true, and I believe it myself, and I've talked to Beverly about this, and we are already thinking, what shall we do? But if it is true, we are going to see the greatest change in society, in the history, possibly, of the world. Because when America goes bankrupt, and she goes into hyperinflation, the rest of the world is going to go downhill with her. And we are not going to have a depression. It is going to be beyond a depression. I obviously don't remember the depression that came with the collapse of Wall Street in 1929, but my mother does. And my mother and my father had a business, and they had some money in the bank in Australia. And my mother and my father told me the story of how they went along to the bank because they'd heard that Wall Street had collapsed, and bankers were jumping out of skyscrapers, you know, they'd given up in despair, and my mother and my father went to the bank to get their few dollars, or their few pounds, out of an Australian bank, and there was a sign on the door of the bank that said, closed, closed, and those banks did not open, and they lost everything they ever had, but in those days, people, I think, were a little more resilient. And as my friend Bob New said, people back in those days had been taught by the church and the government that you've got to take it. And if the government says, you've got no money, and we've got no money, they were taught, you've just got to lie down and take it. But I want to tell you today, we have introduced a system into America today, right now, where people are not going to take it. And what is going to happen, there are going to be riots, there is going to be an overturning of society such as this world has never seen, and the words of that little Adventist prophet are going to come to pass. There is going to be rioting and a time of trouble such as never was. Now, you say to me, Pastor Carter, where did all of this start? Well, what I'm going to tell you now, you need to know. But some of you won't like discovering the truth. And some of you watching here in Los Angeles on television, you won't like it. And that's another reason you need to hear it. Here it is. All of us remember the New Deal that was brought to this country by President Roosevelt. And because of the collapse of the American economy, or because of the, it didn't collapse, but because of the, the Great Recession, the Great Depression, Roosevelt came into power on this theme, the New Deal. And let me tell you what the New Deal was all about. The New Deal said this, 
what private people cannot do and what they have been shown to be irresponsible in doing, the government is going to do. And no longer are we going to have banks do their own thing, but we are going to have a very strong central banking system, and the government is going to take care of you and everything. And so starting after the Great Depression, now listen to this because this statement is a shocker. This great nation that was founded on the principles of republicanism and Protestantism, this country accepted, in fact, the doctrines of socialism. Now you say to me, but we're not communists. I want to tell you, the doctrines of communism have been sown in this country, and it goes back to the New Deal. Many things that that president did were great things for the American people, and some great things were done. But I want to tell you, what started back there with the introduction of the teachings of socialism, which are the very opposite to the teachings of Protestant republicanism. Now, I, I want to give you some illustrations of this. I want to read you a statement now, and I'm going to take it out of this book, but I'm going to read you a statement from Karl Marx. And of course, Karl Marx was the gentleman who started the great communist fiasco. Listen to these words. Karl Marx said, A democracy is not a form of government to survive. He didn't know then that neither was communism. <laughs> he said, Democracy is not a form of government to survive, for it will only succeed until its citizens discover they can vote themselves money from the treasury. Then they will bankrupt the treasury, and that will destroy democracy. Now, I'm going to tell you, because I've studied American history, and I know what I'm talking about here. People who came to this country had a different attitude to most of us today. The people who came to this country believed in the Bible. And they believed in what was known as the Protestant work ethic that if you wanted something, you didn't turn to the government for a handout, you went and worked yourself. And this great nation became the greatest nation in the world, and I'll tell you why. It was based on the belief that man was created by God, and every person ought to have a noble independence, and every person deserves a job if he will work. Let me say this, I do not believe every person deserves a job. I do not believe that a person who won't work deserves a job. I do not believe that every person is entitled to a high standard of living. I believe every person who is prepared to work is entitled to a high standard of living. I believe in the Protestant work ethic, and this is why I am so much opposed to communism. Those of you who believe in socialism ought to go to Russia. You ought to go and see what I've seen. You ought to go and see the food lines. You ought to go and see the poverty. And that is what we have imbibed in this country. Did you know today, my beloved American friend, that 80% of my brothers and my sisters in this country are entitled to gifts from the government. Today we have become no longer a proud independent nation where people believe that they ought to support the government. They believe the government is there to support them. And this nation has gone into decline because of the acceptance of the doctrines of socialism. You say, I don't believe it. Well, read these books and you'll believe it. And you'll understand why, why we have so many problems in the world today. And why we have so many problems in Australia. My own country, when I went back there for a camp meeting less than a year ago, stunned me. Australia 20 years ago was called the lucky country. The greatest little country in the world with a higher standard of living than the Americans. Freedom, 
Freedom to work and freedom to be your best. But you know what happened 20 years ago? The Australian people voted in socialism. And I went back there today. There's no inducement to work because the harder you work, the more you're taxed. And so when people work hard in Australia, the government says, well, we're going to take 60, 70 percent of that off you. And we're going to support these people over here who don't believe in work. And so people have lost heart. And I went to the camp meeting and I walked around and I said, what has happened to my country? I can hardly see a new motor car on the streets. What has happened to my country? Why does everything look so shabby? And I'll tell you something. Socialism is like a drug. The more you take it, the more you want it. And when people get hooked on socialism, government handouts, they become addicted and they become slaves. And as my dear old mother said to me, I called her on the phone and on Thursday night to tell her of the work in Russia, and she said, I said, Mother, it's socialism. She says, but it's so good. She said, they just give you stuff. And who'd want to vote them out? Who'd want to vote out a government that is based on the premise, we'll give it to you. We'll pass it out to you. And people say, but, but it's free. All of this stuff is free. It is not free. Somebody's got to pay for it. Now, I want to say this to you. If you've got the courage, now, I'm not saying this to offend you, but if you do get offended, I'm very, very sorry, and I apologize. But it's time that you woke up, and it's time that you started to look at the facts. And I would suggest you get the book, Bankruptcy 1995, and you'll discover it is socialism. Did you know that in our schools today, in America, in the state schools, not our Christian schools, thank God, but in the state schools, they teach socialism. It is taught. It is taught. Kids are taught. The government exists to give you something. I was listening to President Clinton when he was being interviewed in the presidential race. <laughs> and the questions he got asked, I could have been in Russia. One girl put up a hand and she said, Mr. President, if you're elected, what are you going to do about AIDS? Well, he said, we're going to have this program. We're going to get billions from here. Who are we going to get it from? Oh, well, we're going to get billions from here. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Listen, it's not what President Clinton's going to do about AIDS. It's what are you and I going to do about AIDS. Because I want to tell you, if people... Now, we're not talking about wonderful people who've got AIDS, uh, and, and, and I am sympathetic. Let me say this. I am sympathetic with every person who's got AIDS, and I pray that there'll be a cure that is found soon. I pray that. And whether a person's got AIDS through promiscuity or a blood transfusion... That person has my full sympathies. But I want to tell you, we ought to stop looking for the government to do for us what God has told us to do for ourselves. If you want to turn people into a race of slaves, get them hooked on socialism and a government that gives handouts. That's what's happened to us. This is the curse that has come upon America. It is a repudiating, re, repudiation of republicanism. I'm talking about the great republic, not talking about the party. Did you know that when Roosevelt brought in his new deal, which was basically built upon this premise, the government has the right to take your money and give it to somebody else. You know what the Bible calls that? That's stealing. And the USA Supreme Court said that is against the Constitution. And the New Deal was declared by the USA Supreme Court as being absolutely out of line. You know what they did? Well, the Congress would give the money away, and so the US Supreme Court couldn't get it back, and they kept doing this, stonewalling, until in 1939, the justices that opposed the New Deal were kicked out. They got rid of them. Some of them died, but they got rid of them. And what has been happening in the United States of America has been a revolution, and this has caused this eminent decline of the world's greatest economy. Now you say to me, Pastor Carter, uh, make it practical, make it realistic, uh, tell me what I ought to do. 
Is it really true? Yes, it is true. Read these books through. And when you've read these books through, you may find that your thinking will undergo a radical revolution and you may wake up to yourself and you may say, well, I have been sold one of the biggest lies and I've been dumb, but God help me to get back on track. Let me tell you folks some things. In the last century, theologians taught that the world was going to get better and better and better and the millennium was going to come and usher in the kingdom of God with great glory. Peace and prosperity on the earth. Adventists taught, no, there's going to come a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. I want to tell you, the word of God is true and the prophecies are being fulfilled. I want you to take your Bible and come with me to Matthew 24, please. Come with me to Matthew 24 and verse 14 and onwards. Matthew 24 and verse 14 and onwards, please. Matthew 24 and verse 14 and onwards. I want you to notice these words because I believe that what is happening today is a sign that Jesus is going to come. Verse 14, Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. And let not him who is in the field go back to get, get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who have nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath for then there'll be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world unto this time, no, nor ever shall be. The Bible says that before Jesus comes there is going to come a tremendous time of trouble. You just listen to me, friend. We are standing right at the very doors of the fulfillment of this Bible prophecy. And we ought to think of our soul's relationship to God. I want you to come over now to Daniel chapter 12. And here it describes what is going to happen. Please turn to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12 and verse 1 and onwards. And let me say as you're looking up this, this text, I believe it is the responsibility of society to take care for those who are genuinely needy. Did you hear that? I believe that is our responsibility. I believe it is the responsibility of the church. But I do not believe it is the responsibility of government to uh, support the people. I believe it is the responsibility of the people to support the government. Now look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. It's going to happen soon. Even to that time, and at that time, your people, what does it say? <coughs> shall be delivered, everyone whose name is found written in the book. I want to tell you this. Please let these sayings sink down into your ears. If I were preaching you a sermon today and I was saying to you, well, I've got great news for you. Everything's going to be marvelous in the economy. Everything is marvelous in the world. We've got a new world order and everything is wonderful. If I was preaching that, I would be a false prophet. Because the Bible says Jesus is going to come, but before Jesus comes, he says, there is going to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. But the good news, is, it says, but at that time, your people are going to be delivered. God is going to deliver and save his people when Jesus comes. So, let, let us get to the bottom line. And let me ask these questions. What shall we do? How do we prepare? Well, at the start of the sermon, we read the text from Jesus, and Jesus said, don't worry. A child of God is not to worry like the heathen. Heathen worry. But a child of God trusts, 
And it doesn't matter what happens, God, as Steve said in the song, God is going to take care of you. I am not worried about the future because I know the future is in the hands of my Savior. So don't worry. Number two, you should do some practical things. And even though this is not specifically a talk on finances, I would say as much as you can get out of debt. If you got a bunch of credit cards and you got them filled up with debt, you are a part of the problem. Try, if you can, to get out of debt. If I will make a confession to you, when I came here to Southern California and I had to buy a house and I got three children, I went into debt. The greatest debt that I've ever been in. I had a home in Australia. I owned it. I owned my car. I owned my house. But when I came here and uh, had to set up again, we lost just about everything we had. Knowing what I know today, I would not have gone into debt like I've gone into debt. Anybody wants to buy my house, take over the debt, see me. Not after the service, because it's the Sabbath. So if you can, get out of debt. But number three, now listen to this. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things are going to be added unto you. I want to say this. Use your resources today for the preaching of the gospel. You think, you just think of it, my friend. Maybe you're like a friend of mine who's got $200,000 stashed away under his bed. What say if, no, when, not what say, when this happens, maybe his $200,000 in a week is going to be worth two hundred, dollars and he's going to come to me and say, Pastor Carter, I'm sure sorry I never gave you that money to, to take the gospel to the Russians. Some people have the idea that they're giving money to us to take the gospel. It is our responsibility of every Christian to preach the gospel and to carry the gospel. I want to say to you today, if this is true, when hyperinflation comes, all those millions that you're storing away will not be worth the paper. In fact, in Germany, they use million-dollar marks to wallpaper their bedrooms. So use resources for God's kingdom. And here is the fourth. The first one is this. Don't worry. Number two, if you can, get out of debt. Number three, use your resources for the preaching of the gospel. If this drops upon us. It's going to happen fast. Once it starts, you won't be able to do anything. Once it starts, and inflation, if they start to print money, then you'll find the dollar was worth a dollar, then it's worth half a dollar, then within a few days it'll be worth a cent. Like the Russian ruble, when I went to Russia a few years ago, I had to pay $1.30 US dollars, $1.30 to get a ruble. Now when I go to Russia, last time I was there, for every dollar they gave me 1,500 rubles. And I think now it's 2,000 rubles to a dollar, and so money that is stored away, when it hits you, you won't better rush to the bank and do a smart deal, it'll be gone. So that's the third thing. But the fourth one is this, be glad. <laughs> be glad about the news of the collapsing economy. Come over here to Luke 21, and let me tell you why. Be glad it's as bad as it is because it is a sign that something great is going to happen soon. Luke 21, and we're going to start at verse 25. The worse it gets for the world, the better it gets for the child of God. But you've got to have faith to believe that. You know, uh, people who are in the know today are, are scared almost to death. Uh, this man here, he says, I've gone to Latin America, I've talked to those nations, and they say, why are the Americans doing what we have done? Have they gone crazy? Why are they doing this? The people in Brazil say, why are they doing this? Don't they know that this is what caused our downfall? Why are the Americans doing this? And so these things are scaring people like uh, this man here, Mr. Figgy, 
Harry Figgy, but I want to tell you they're not scaring me because these things tell us we're going home. Luke 21, verse 25, and there'll be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, on the earth, distress of nations. I tell you, friend, that's it, distress of nations, worth perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. You think of our beloved ex-president George Bush, he said, well, we've got a new world order. He almost said hallelujah. He said, no more wars, the Russians are now our buddies. No more wars in Europe, they're killing each other over there like, like nothing since the Nazis, they're as bad as the Nazis. The Croatians, who are the Catholics, are fighting the Serbs, who are in, uh, the Orthodox. Then you've got the Muslims, they're fighting, uh, uh, I think 50,000 uh, Croatian women have been raped and are carrying uh, the babies of Serbian soldiers to demoralize them. Nobody's going to want the babies. He said, we're going to have a great world order. We're going to have a new world order. He's right, we're going to have a new world order, but it's not going to be what those smart politicians thought, my friend. The new world order is going to be a time of trouble such as never was, and the Bible says these awful events are going to be the birth pangs to bring in the kingdom of God. You see? Now, when a mother has a baby, and my wife had three of them, Having a baby is not a gentle pastime. I was shocked and stunned. I thought, this is awful. You know, so much pain, so much suffering for so long. But then the birth pangs give way to a, a new creation. Did you know that's the very expression Jesus used? He said, these are the birth pangs of the new age. We're going to go through the birth pangs, but we're going to be part of the new creation. So that's the good news. And so you ought to rejoice and take your religion seriously. Take it seriously. Okay, there'll be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity. How are we going to balance the budget? What are we going to do? We're riding a tiger. How do we get off the tiger? If we get off the tiger, he's going to eat us. But if we stay on the tiger, it's, it's worse. The sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. That's what Jesus said. Now, my news to you today is not a weak message. It is not a soft message. It is not a message to lull you to sleep. It is not to scratch your ears and say, well, it's just marvelous to be alive today. And isn't everything wonderful? And isn't it great to be thinking positively and getting better and better? Boy, it turns me off. You hear it everywhere. They think it's sophisticated. It's not sophisticated, it's stupid. I have a strong word for you today. Here it is. We are living at the climax of world history. Those things that we have predicted are coming, and you and I need to make some radical changes. I want to say, I don't say this with any shame. If you've got money that you're sitting on, if you're like the man who said, get all you can, can all you get, then sit on the lid. That's the can-do religion. If you're like that person, you ought to change your thinking because soon it's going to be, you know the Bible says they're going to cast their silver in the streets. Their gold is going to be removed. You know, that's just talking about money. If that text had been written, it'd say they'll cast their dollar bills in the streets. You know why? Because they're not worth the brass razu, they're not worth anything. Get rid of the garbage, you see. Just throw it out in the streets, it clutters up the house. You'll need this much to buy a loaf of bread. So they're going to cast it all in the streets. Therefore, we need, I tell you, to get a, a right hierarchy of values. A sense of priorities. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And when we go through the storm and the boat is tossed 
on the waves and we wonder whether we're going to sink or not. We need to sit back and be calm and look to the helm and we will see that the helm is in the hands of a man who is called the Son of God. And the hand on the helm is the hand that was nailed to the cross. And all these great events are given to us to teach us, look up, lift up your heads, sing and rejoice. Your redemption is drawing nigh. Thank God. Praise the Lord.